I'm Alison Aubrey of NPR News. Welcome here. On behalf of the World Economic Forum, I'd like to get started, introduce our panel. For the next hour, we're going to be talking about this idea of feel, feel better or your money back. This past year, GlaxoSmithKline introduced a one-shot gene therapy for a rare disease. The cost of the drug was about $500,000. And the idea was that if it didn't work, you'd get your money back. It's an example of new models, new ways of pricing healthcare. The question we're really going to be focusing on here today is what are the other innovations that are nudging us to sort of a pay for performance model or to value-based medicine? So I'd like to begin by introducing panelists one by one. Lloyd Dean here is President and Chief Executive Officer of Dignity Health. He's been named one of the most influential people in healthcare by modern healthcare. Give us, start out by giving us a sense of um, examples from what you see from the Dignity <coughs> side. What are the triggers that make it happen, that lead to innovations and more nudging us towards pay, pay for performance? I think a lot of the impetus is really coming from uh, the consumer, patients, uh, and from the community. Uh, as you know, the question, the formal question was, is this, is this time ripe um, for us to be talking about uh, pricing versus uh, value? And I think that, that that horse has already left the, left the barn. Uh, I think that uh, when we talk about a concept called value-based, um, that uh, what that to me says is that uh, consumers, patients, uh, payers are questioning uh, for the dollars uh, that are being expended, uh, are we truly uh, getting a yield on that or in is that uh, pro proportional? Uh, I think that, uh, but in order for us to talk about price, uh, we have to talk about payment. And one of the things that we certainly have in the United States uh, is a misalignment uh, at, uh, at times, and I think to some extent uh, exists as we sit here today, uh, under the old fee-for-service model, uh, it would drive us down one path. Uh, but I think you know, when we talk about uh, value and when we talk about payment systems that truly get at, you know, are we achieving uh, what uh, we set out uh, to achieve, and is that measurable, and is that uh, happening in the eye of the user, which uh, in my world uh, is patients and consumers. So tricky to implement, but the way of the future. Yes. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Omar Ishraq. He is the chairman and chief executive officer of Medtronic, the world's largest medical device company. How do you see this, Omar? What do you think are the triggers for innovation? Well, first, um, in our view, uh, which is really been the mission of our company all along. You know, we're a technology company uh, aiming to change outcomes, both technology and outcomes. Uh, therefore, by definition, all our innovation is geared and measured by the impact that we have through changing outcomes. Well, value-based healthcare is, in fact, uh, the improvement outcome of outcomes at a given cost. So from our perspective, how can it be bad if we actually get paid for what we work to do, which is to improve outcomes. Uh, and in fact, the entire healthcare system, if you broaden it, in the end, that is the goal, to cure somebody to either, either by prevention of escalation or by treatment to improve their outcomes. And I don't think there's a choice in the long run but to gravitate the entire healthcare ecosystem to a mode where the payments are based on reaching certain outcomes at the lowest possible cost, but both have to be in the, in the frame. So the task really becomes one, one of how do you operationalize it, and that's where uh, it starts to get difficult. And uh, although everyone can agree on the uh, overall philosophy when it comes to implementing it, we found that the fee-per-service system has been structured in a way and institutionalized in a way that almost makes it difficult to break and move to a system where one gets paid for an outcome because the sorts of collaborations that are required are sometimes even prohibited 
because the assumption is it'll always be a fee-per-service system. So, so those barriers have to be removed. I think the other things, uh, a few of the things that Lloyd touched on, uh, the, the clarity of definition of outcomes. If you're going to be paid for it, you've got to be able to define it and measure it in a way that you can put money down on the line. Your ability to measure cost, to baseline cost, uh, to equate, uh, to, to estimate what improvement you can make and therefore say that this is what it's worth. So, you know, there's a lot of operationalizing, uh, there's a lot of elements here uh, to take care of as you operationalize. I think the one thing that I'll say is that uh, you've got to do this in a granular fashion. I think this is not a magic light switch, that uh, it can be done through one sweeping change. I think uh, you have to take this thing element by element and, uh, and operationalize. So we'll get back to this, sort of the obstacles of overcoming this fee-for-service model. I wanted to introduce Joseph Jimenez. He's the chief executive officer of Novartis here in Switzerland. Joseph, how do you see this? What do you see as, as, as the key factors in nudging healthcare towards a more a break from pay for performance and more towards value-based medicine? Well, I don't think we're going to have to nudge the healthcare systems because if you just look at basic demographic trends and you look at the numbers of people that are coming in terms of that 50-plus age group, that's going to be a crushing financial um, burden on healthcare systems around the world. So the way that at Novartis we think about this is it is inevitable that the market has got to move to a value-based system because the health systems aren't going to be able to afford to pay for the elderly that are coming in the next 10 to 20 years. So, you know, when you think about pharmaceuticals, the shift from, we at Novartis think about the shift from transaction to outcomes-based where we will get paid at least some element of our payment based on the way that our drug performs. So did we deliver the agreed outcome for the patient? And a perfect example is our drug uh, for heart failure called Entresto which is clinically proven to reduce hospitalization by 20%. Well, that's a huge expense in the healthcare system. And yet, Entresto can help reduce that by 20%. So we've entered into a number of, of contracts with payers in both the US and Europe where we get paid on that drug's ability to deliver on what we said. And I think that's where it's going. We'll talk about more examples of that. I want to introduce Risa Leviso Morey. She's Chief Executive Officer and President of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And I should acknowledge that RDBJ is also a, a funder of NPR, the organization that I work for. Risa, you have an MD and uh, also a business degree. So you mm -hmm. have a, a, an interesting or different perspective. How do you see this going forward? Well, I'd like to widen the aperture just a little bit. and. Think about this from the perspective of patients, um, and particularly when I, and I'm a geriatrician, so when I think about older patients and how they define what's of value to them, it's not just whether um, their immediate condition has been alleviated, it's whether they feel better, they're more functional, they're able to stay at home and stay out of the hospital. And if we're going to try to achieve that kind of value, we're going to need to expand not just the integration across the healthcare system and not just including public health systems that address prevention and, and uh, disease prevention. We're also going to have to include social supports um, that will help with transportation and housing. I can tell you as a geriatrician who used to make house calls, the thing that was best able to help me keep someone out of the hospital was uh, the conditions of their home uh, whether they had food security and uh, their social network. So I think those are some of the things we're going to need to include if we're really going to have accountable care organization, health care organizations and accountable care communities to support those health care organizations. Got it. So <clears throat> Lloyd, I want to go back to you. You mentioned this sort of misalignment and talking about how tricky, tricky to implement, but clearly moving away from fee-for-service is the way of the future. Talk a little bit about what you've done at Dignity over the last decade. When you started there, it was a very different place. You've driven a lot of change there, reorganized structures, gotten rid of managers to try to drive efficiencies. Talk a little bit about how you bring this new, this new model into Dignity. Because one, one of the things that we've tried to do is to expand the definition of outcomes. Because it's, it, 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 it's relative to what lens uh, you are looking through. Uh, an example, uh, cost is one lens. If it's, you know, how do we get to the lowest uh, cost 
uh, environment, that's going to put you on uh, one uh, pathway. Uh, from a patient uh, perspective, uh, we all know that everybody wants good clinical uh, outcomes. Uh, but I'll contrast my daughter and my wife. Uh, my daughter, when she uh, accesses uh, health care, she wants to be close to her, she wants to be, it to be quick, uh, and she wants in and out, and that's it. Uh, my wife, her definition of a good outcome, uh, she wants time with the physician. She wants to understand uh, what's uh, happening to her. I would further expand the definition to think about, you know, again, where you sit within our equal, equal system. Um, we take care of a lot of patients, and their definition of uh, a good outcome certainly is clinically uh, related but if they can get to the care site, can they get there uh, safely? Can they be treated uh, in a way that's kind uh, and uh, just? Will somebody take the time to explain not what's happening today, but what's this journey that they're going on? So what we've tried to do is look at the totality uh, of this thing we call uh, outcome, and we've tried to be able to dissect what are the value opportunities uh, within that context. And what are the value opportunities? I think there are a lot of value opportunities. Number one is yes, we need to be efficient. So one of the things that you were alluding to when I came to uh, our uh, organization uh, was that we, we had an abundance of different uh, layers of management, and it got a lot of press. Uh, that I collapse those uh, uh, levels of, of management. Uh, that wasn't just to collapse and to disrupt people. It was to try to get our cost of, if you will, the management side down so that we can invest in capital, invest in our uh, employees, uh, and also uh, create uh, the systems and the various um, uh, underlying systems so that we could move uh, down the journey of quality care. Omar, I'm trying to understand, I'm thinking about the kinds of things that Medtronic produces. You make all kinds of medical devices and diagnostic tests. So give me a sense of, some, of, of a way in which the way the healthcare system uses your products uh, could alter the way that your products are paid for. I mean, if your diagnostic devices can change outcomes and lead to better care, or better outcomes for patients, does that influence what the healthcare system pays for your, your diagnostics? Well, it should. I, I think the diagnostics one is one step removed because you need to, uh, to change an outcome, you can't just do the diagnostics. You've got to do the treatment and the follow-up as well. So as the diagnostics are integrated, in, the, in, in that ent entire chain, uh, I think first we'll be uh, motivated to have more and more pieces of that uh, continuum uh, and then get paid for the overall result. Uh, I think the, the example that Joe gave is very pertinent and uh, we've got lots of examples where we have therapies rather than diagnostics uh, where we put you know, some things like stents in or, uh, or uh, joints in, for example, sure. or, or, or very, very clear uh, treatment mechanisms for which we sign up for exactly the same sort of thing. I mean, almost the same model. But uh, what, what, just like what Joe said, the outcome definition has to be clear. That this is what I, if you do, the, if you didn't do it, this is what you'd get. If you do it, this is what you're going to get. Here's the difference and pay us the, you know, we'll share the savings or, or some kind of thing. And that's how you price it. You don't talk about the pricing. You say we'll share the savings. And the pricing gets built into it. That, that's the kind of model that eventually we'd like to get to uh, across everything. Because if what we do doesn't achieve something like that, then why are we doing it? You know, if, if uh, we were spending like, you know, I don't know, several billion dollars a year in, in R&D, and I get a stack of uh, proposals, uh, you know, every, every month saying, you know, <coughs> pay, fund this program and that program, and all of them say that this is what it does. Well, let's get paid for it. <laughs> But to do that, you need to be able to uh, articulate and quantify uh, what the expected result will be and then stick your neck out. 
Let me ask you, Joe, give us an example or tell, tell us a little bit more about how Entrusto is working. How is it that you're measuring that the drug is working? Who is it that gets to decide or declare, yes, this has worked? And what have you found so far? Well, the first thing we would do is we would sit down with the payer or with the payer provider. And, and many times it works better with an integrated um, health care system because they control not only the payer or the, the payment, but also the care. Mm -hmm. and, and that's when it works the best. We agree on what the outcome will be because that's critical. So will it be a reduction in hospitalization for a certain cohort of patients? Um, and then we uh, measure that. And this is one of the key barriers, right? You can't move to an outcomes-based system until you have the data to so that it's easy to collect. For example, many payers that we approach say, we love the idea, we'd love to try to eliminate waste and pay you on the outcome, but we don't have the systems to be able to collect that data in an easy way, therefore we're out. So we've got to work really on building a data infrastructure that will enable us to re read real world outcomes in a real world setting. Some payer providers that are integrated have it today, uh, particularly in Europe, there's a great uh, use of data. And that makes an outcomes-based system much more viable because you've got that basic infrastructure in place. Got it. Steve Ruskowski, I want to move to you, Chairman and President, Chief Executive Officer of Quest Diagnostics. I want to talk a little bit about, um, about how this new model could change the way you do business. So Quest is really mo sort of moving towards this empowering health uh, with diagnostics. Give us an example of, of, of how things are, how your model's changing. Sure, sure. So, you know, the business we're in is, um, the business that's the beginning of what happens in healthcare. So we represent in most markets about 2% of healthcare cost, but the other 98% is very dependent on the, the you know, diagnostic workup that happens. And with that diagnostics comes treatment, either a device or a pharma or some other treatment informed, and then also management of that patient. So when you talk about pay for performance, that diagnosis, the right treatment, and the monitoring performance versus whatever outcomes measure you might have is instrumental in all that. And we're moving away from uh, you know, a trial and error fee-for-service world, particularly in the United States, the one that has much more precision. And um, you know, this conference and other conferences, there's a lot of talk about precision medicine and personalized healthcare. And by way of an example, we're delivering today uh, to the world a product that we've worked with Memorial Sloan Kettering, one of the cancer centers uh, in North America, one of the best in the world, that they have 34 actionable genes. They're made up with those drugs that will work with those genes. And if there's not a match for a patient, we'll also identify the clinical trials you can roll that patient in. So you're guaranteed, if you're against that match, if you will, that the drug will work. And so we're taking it out of New York City and moving it to the rest of the United States and throughout the world. A great example of mating up the measurement to make sure what you're delivering does work. Got it. And um, I'm imagining that this is a completely new model for you when you think about Quest Diagnostics. You think about, I mean, I think about having your blood drawn, sure. right? So yep. that those tests can be sent back to your doctor. Right. So they're doing something as simple as, a, yeah, you know, as, as diagnosing simple diseases. You're talking about moving into a completely yeah. new All ends era. of the spectrum, yeah. from the most basic to the most sophisticated. Genetic testing versus the most simple. And, and, and the most simple is keeping people healthy. Uh, we work with a number of organizations and we're selling it to providers, selling it to employers, selling it to insurance companies, a wellness product where annually you get checked up, you have a biometric screen and also a full battery of tests. And it gives that individual a good baseline and actually employers, the people in most cases in the United States that are paying the bill, are actually incenting their employees to make progress against those, those numbers. And, and if they make progress, there's, there's a performance uh, incentive they'll have less expense for their healthcare benefit cost going forward. So on that side of the equation too, it's actually engaging and empowering the consumer or the patient in this case in their health and looking at the measurements of their health information going forward uh, to make progress in their health and prevent problems from happening. 
Reese, I want to talk a little bit about this. We talked about, you were talking about health and wellness being, you know, the doctor-patient relationship is a key part of it and has been a key part of it uh, for a long time. But as we think about a new paradigm, we think about all the other actors in society that can sort of promote wellness or empower wellness. So Steve just gave us this example of working with employers to have people have wellness checks. Do you see this as a big part of moving forward or innovation in terms of empowering people to be well outside of the relationship they might have with a doctor or healthcare system? Of course. <laughs> uh, when you think about how much time we actually spend engaged with the healthcare system, it's actually a very small amount of uh, the days of a year. And uh, many of the decisions about how we can help people be healthier occur in boardrooms and uh, in Congress and in other places where the policy actually meets the ability to uh, give people healthier choices. And so I think that that's one part of it. Uh, the other part is, is, as I was saying before, expanding how we can keep people out of the healthcare system. Uh, and a good example is what's gone on in Camden. Camden in the US, for those of you who know it, is one of the poorest communities. And there are some people who are very high utilizers of the healthcare system. Um, when you look across all of the hospitals there, they can identify who those high utilizers are. And many times, the things that keep them going back to the emergency room, keep them uh, using healthcare services, are things like uh, an inability to get transportation or an inability to have access to uh, housing that's going to be conducive to them being healthy. So I think when you put those two concepts together, yes, health, and I like that you describe health systems as opposed to health care systems, becomes a, a much broader concept for us. Lloyd, I want to go back to you and, and just pivoting off this point that for people to be well and to have a health care system, it's broader than what happens in the hospital. It matters, do they have transportation? It matters what employers are saying to them about wellness. Is this a threat to the traditional hospital model where you need people to be sick and to come in to get care? Or can you partner with other organizations so that you all benefit by promoting wellness? And I, th and I think that's... Uh, one of the theories be behind, um, you know, the the healthcare systems uh, that we put in place certainly uh, over the last um, uh, eight years. I think the day where, uh, as a provider, that you know our incentive is to get more people uh, coming through the door have passed. Uh, we have to go in uh, to the to the community. Certainly, we need acute care. Uh, facilities. But uh, when you think about uh, future payment systems, uh, we have to make sure uh, that we're delivering care, uh, not just in a cost-effective way, uh, but in a way that's meeting the need uh, of uh, the patient. Uh, one of the things that deeply concerns me when we talk about uh, value-based or when we talk about pay for performance uh, is really the, the heart of your question, and that is uh, what's behind that? I mean, everyone comes to the table understanding the simple that when I pay X and I have an expectation, I expect to get that. I do something, I expect something over here. That's not a complex uh, concept. But why we're having this discussion is there, there has, there's a perception that there's been a disconnect, uh, that consumers patients uh, don't understand why in one environment I can have a knee replaced at 5,000. Why can I go across the street and that's 15,000? Uh, from their standpoint, that's, that's an Doesn't issue. Doesn't make sense. Uh, transparency. I want to understand uh, what are the elements uh, that I'm paying for, what, even whether I'm insured uh, or, or, or not. And as was said, what are the social determinants um, that are driving it? So, of course, we want to make sure uh, that uh, those who come to our facilities that uh, on all levels uh, their, of their health, uh, that uh, we fulfill uh, that. Uh, but there is no incentive for us 
uh, to have people coming into our EDs and having uh, people have bad experience and continually uh, coming back. And that's some of what has been tried to be addressed through this thing we call pay for performance. Uh, and again, I can't say enough that we have to make sure that when we talk about pay, that we have that corollary discussion about payment methodologies because there certainly is a disconnect. When I bill uh, uh, most of the uh, payers that uh, we work with, I know that I'm gonna be, I'm gonna build them at X. I'm gonna be paid X minus. And that's, that's the way we, our system operates. And of course, I, as a consumer, know none of this. If I have insurance, then this is worked out between you and, and the payer. So there is a lack of transparency for that person who wants to know why there's $5,000 for having knee replacement one place and 15 at the next. And that's where that consumer movement uh, is coming from. You ought to know. Yeah, Steve. So, so um, what you just said is changing considerably. Uh, many of us around here are large employers. Um, and this is a U.S. Uh, portion of the discussion. In the U.S., uh, a large portion of the healthcare system is played by employer-sponsored healthcare. Right. And those uh, that are in that marketplace have pushed more of the cost to our employees. So 40 to 50 percent of, uh, of working Americans are now paying for the, a large portion of their healthcare cost. So increasingly every day, they're becoming much more aware of the costs they're paying and the variations and the differences in quality and costs associated with different care options, and they're making choices. Sure, the so, more I pay, the more I need to know how so, I can bargain. So in the past you were not aware, today right. you're becoming increasingly aware, and there's wide variation, and it's changing. It's changing. So healthcare systems in the future, to Lloyd's point, will compete on the basis of the rest of us compete on quality and cost. And in a quality cost, we typically have warranty periods. If it doesn't work, you can go back, we'll fix it. And, and we have performance guarantees, and we compete with competitors based upon outcomes. So that's where healthcare is headed. It's much more of a commercial-oriented model than what we typically have had in the past. And it seems transparency is really key to that. Yes, you have to have the data, uh, both on quality and cost. And, and then the consumer, um, at a rapid pace, is becoming educated around this and understanding when they get those bills in the mail from the payer what they should be paying or not paying, and where there might be some other choices they can make. Um, yeah, go ahead. And I wanted to ask you also, I know you, when you were General Electric um, and your work now with Medtronic, throughout your career you've done a lot of work in, in China, India, developing countries, bringing affordable care there. And I'm wondering when you're starting from scratch in countries that don't have you know, health insurance systems and you're bringing new technologies to these places, have you learned anything about the models there that could help uh, that, could, that could be used in the United States to sort of drive efficiencies? Well, uh, let's, uh, let me first make the in initial comment sure. I was going to make, which is uh, to, to the discussions we just had. I think the, let's not trivialize the, uh, the outcome portion of that because a consumer or patient uh, you know, understanding what to expect is important. And, 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 and the payment that we're talking about is to some degree tied to that um, to that, to reaching that expectation, and, and whether the payment patient gets the benefit of that, um, uh, of that, uh, you know, plus or minus on the expense is, is a different discussion. Or the, or the, or the payer or the healthcare system gets it in an insurance environment. It's a little more complex. But in the end, you're trying to reach a certain expected level of outcome or performance mm -hmm. that the patient can perceive, mm -hmm. which will then have an effect on the total amount of cost that is spent to get there, and only when all of that is put together to get a complete picture. So a value-based system or an outcomes-based system has to have all of those components. And, and that's why I say you need to do this thing condition by condition. Sure. Uh, otherwise, it gets too complicated and, and, and averaged out. And, but I'm just and, and, thinking through how you build that. I mean, I've never had the experience where I've gone to the doctor and six months later they say, hey, how did you like that you know, ACL no. repair I gave you? I mean, who's keeping track yeah. of... No, what, but that's what, yeah. what has to be built. And that, that's what we're all saying, that that does not exist yeah. uh, today. But you know, in uh, Joe's uh, example, uh, you know, someone's measuring that that person didn't go back to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And if they did, there's a consequence. Uh, because Joe had committed that you're not going to go back to the hospital. And, you know, we have examples like that which I won't dwell on, but we're, we're very similar. Yeah. Uh, but I think Joe will agree that this is not a natural act for pairs to agree to or, or the systems. You know, this is a lot of 
work and 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 and, and sort of granular, detailed, you know, legal agreements and all it all is, the rest. A, yeah. So it's not only the data that has to be yeah. put in place; it's also regulatory. So, for exactly. example, we're not even able to contract uh, with payers on quality of life. Some of the quality of life benefits that we know our drugs deliver because it's not in the label, and that's considered off-label promotion if we did a contract. So, and I think the organizations like the FDA and the EMA are starting to understand that that's the case, and if we have to move to value-based uh, health care, we're going to need to change the regulatory system, the data system, and then also, as a manufacturer of a drug, if I'm going to be paid based on the outcome, I want to control more than just the drug, the drug delivering to that patient. So you we're want looking to know at that things like compliance and right. Exactly. So we're looking at how do we enter remote patient monitoring, ensuring that that patient is taking the medicine because we're going to be paid at the other right. end. Because so you're much more integrated into yeah. the delivery of the drug. We but, will have to become. And th that's similar. I've got the same kind of things. And in our case, when you actually put an implant in, the surgeon put an implant in. How well did they do that? So all of those become variables. And, and in fact, in our analysis of the, uh, the value-based models to uh, prioritize are ones in which they're the fewest variables. Mm. That means that the easiest to put in and the patient needs to do the least, mm -hmm. and you'll see a result. And then scale that. Mm -hmm. Because that's the easiest to put in place. Yeah. Uh, the moment you get into you know five six variables where you know you're depending on the skill of the doctor, you're depending on the adherence of the patient to a certain regimen, multiple drugs, measurement gets stuff. I mean, let's let's kind of put those aside for a while till the till the models get cleaned up, till some of the more basic regulatory challenges get uh, overcome, and then we can implement the very complex models. And that's why a step by step approach to this is very important. And, and so, I, I would add too. Um, you know, uh, be, you know, because I think if you listen at this conversation, uh, one might think that uh, you know slitting the wrist is the uh, best option here. Slitting the wrist. Uh, yeah, but uh, <laughs> okay. my, my my point is that all is not lost. Uh, I you know I pray every night uh, that one of the things that's not perfect, but that we don't lose in this country is this concept called bundled payment. Mm. What is bundled payment? What has it done? Uh, really, it forced kids who didn't like playing together to play together. From a consumer perspective, it said, you know, for that, for, for that issue, we're going to pay you X. And statistically, we've arrived at that X. So for people in the room who might not know the term bundle payment, give an example. of What that basically is, to keep it uh, simple, is that uh, you've got the hospital, you've got the physician, you've got all of the various uh, touch points that uh, as we go through the health system there are uh, in that historically you had to deal with them as independent uh, entities and you as the, the consumer or the patient uh, rightly or wrongly would get caught up uh, in the middle of dealing with all of these uh, entities. Uh, but from a regulatory and, uh, and a, pro, a policy perspective, uh, what we moved to was, you know what, we're going to pay for that episode of care. Mm -hmm. You folks, the physicians, all of the various pieces, you figure out how to divide it up. It incentivizes us to understand those different elements. Uh, it incentivizes us to look at the value uh, of that and to figure out what do we really need uh, versus what uh, uh, can, can, can we have? So, you know, all is not lost. Uh, there, it's not perfect, but I think this issue of value-based and this issue of pay-for performance, there are models, uh, policies, practices uh, that can move us in a systemic way to that. Steve. And part of this is when you get to that mindset, if you're thinking about the output, mm -hmm. which is patient outcomes for a specific episode, you then think about all your different elements of the value you're delivering. And then you start to ask the question, is it better for me to do that or someone else? And mm -hmm. what we're engaging in conversations with integrated delivery systems on the laboratory side of things, mm -hmm. is it best for them to continue to operate some of their laboratories or go to someone who has much more value, much more efficiency, and apply that to the problem of getting better output at lower cost. And, and then they start competing on the basis of output, which changes the way of thinking about healthcare 
from the past. So this, and what I hear you saying is that, you know, we shouldn't be thinking of drug companies and diagnostic companies and device makers. We should be thinking about the whole this value chain. In an integrated way. So who's in the best position to, to build this system, Risa? Well, uh, I don't know that anyone is in the absolute best right. position to, to build it, but certainly the providers of care, um, whether they are integrated systems or uh, integrated systems that are connected to uh, community-based organizations and the like, I think have the, the longest view mm -hmm. and um, probably are the ones that you can, and already have in many ways the platforms and the relationships to uh, augment the systems that they have. So I think that's a reasonable starting place. Yeah. Now, I just wanted to make one other point related to what uh, Omar and Joe were saying about uh, having these models be relatively simple to start. And certainly, uh, as a scientist, you would, you would want to do that. But uh, what we're trying to get to is so complex that I think we're going to have to push ourselves to put some of the messiness in uh, early on and be willing to, to fail and to acknowledge that uh, we aren't going to get it right the first time if we, uh, but if we don't start putting in some of these functional status measures, some of the other more complex uh, areas like medical problems as opposed to uh, surgical problems that have a simpler <coughs> model, I think it, it'll, it, we won't get there, certainly in my lifetime or anyone's lifetime in this room. So we're going to have to push ourselves. Yeah, and we've sort of slipped into talking about the U.S. healthcare system. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Um, yeah. so let me, yeah. I can go back to your question on, if you want me to. Well, it made me think, you yeah. know, when we talk about, yeah. you know, an integrated system, and, you know, there's the National yeah. Health Service. Yeah. Uh, you know, are we moving, do we move towards something no, like No, but you see the National Health right. Service, and, uh, a, I think people from the U.K., probably won't disagree with me, but it is more of a label. It's still a fee-per-service system within the national health care system. So uh, I think there are some attempts at integrated care, but by and large, their payment mechanisms is by procedure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so they're not really using the fact that there's a single payer, whatever value that may have. I mean, we have single payers too. You know, an insurance company is a single pair, an integrated uh, health care system is a single pair with substantial populations. So I, I don't think you know, just labeling something as single pair solves the problem. I think you have to do the, the hard work of uh, doing all of the things that we talked about, you know, the simple ones and the more complex yeah. ones. Yeah. Well, you know, it gets down to who's going to take the risk for the population. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, today I take the risk for my employees. So I'm the population yeah. health man. <laughs> exactly. I'm paying all the bills. <laughs> and I see this fragmented system and wide variation in the system, and I look at all the claims data, and I have 60,000 people I'm looking at. Uh, so a lot of the providers are now integrating. Mm -hmm. So they're buying physicians, they're getting into the healthcare insurance business, and eventually they might be the people providing that population health for me. Mm -hmm. Some of the insurance companies in the United States are moving into the, the provider business. They might be the pre people that are providing. In the case of California, Kaiser right. uh, is represented right. here. Does that for me in California as one of the systems that we use? So that's the model is somebody has to take responsibility for that life and start to re-engineer mm -hmm. the value of delivering health care and, and compete on the basis of how well they do that every year like any business, mm -hmm. like our businesses. But I, I would you, just say, you know, we tried not to go there uh, on, you know, the discussion about today's uh, health care system in this transition. Um, uh, but, you know, I'm going to... Uh, 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 let you into a little secret uh, to the answer to your question about, you know, who who best to bring all of this uh, together. And I, I agree with my colleague. It's not a single entity that I, I think. But uh, contrary to some folks' uh, views, I think that the, the providers do have an opportunity because of the relationship uh, and frequency with the patient. I think that the physicians uh, have an opportunity to, to be a part of that or play that integrator uh, role. But when you look at this a little broader, there is a policy uh, piece of this, uh, particularly when you talk about scale, particularly when you talk about Medicare, particularly when you talk about a Medi-Cal and Medicaid. Yes, uh, there is an element of, quote, the free enterprise system uh, in competition. Uh, but this is not like, um, you know, other uh, business segments. There does have to be, yes, even 
a role uh, for government. And I know we're about to go on a journey to uh, debate that. Uh, I don't, and, and I'll even scale it up to the federal and national level. We cannot leave this to all only the states. We cannot leave this just to uh, the government. But you need each of those pieces in the consumer and employers, uh, for all of us have to be in the game or the game doesn't work. I want to open it up to questions uh, around the room. Raise your hand if you'd like to jump into the conversation. Yeah, right over here. Thank you. Really amazing session. Um, I am curious about some of the models that you see that provide value in this system related to um, informal caregiving. So family and friends and others who are playing an important role as healthcare moves more into homes um, and how that kind of plays into some of the things you're talking about today. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, the, you know, the topic we're intending to talk about is how do we uh, guarantee healthcare? And so we deliver something. And we spent a lot of time on acute care in the discussion and less time on yeah. the other elements of, of a healthcare delivery system. And preventative care and wellness is, is an important part of this. And, and management of chronic disease is an important part of this. And so going back to the example I used, where you, where you could have a perfectly healthy person today. And if you had your laboratory work done or some type of diagnostic, you could find out you're pre-diabetic. And if we could find you soon enough, and if you have the proper programs in place with, with weight reduction or coaching programs and your family's involved in that, you can move from a place that's moving in the wrong direction to the place you need to be. And, and we actually are working with small startups that are providing that service and they will guarantee that in, in this case your glucose will come down, your hemoglobin A1C will come down over a 12-month period of time that move you from at risk to not at risk. And, and very much part of the program is getting your ecosystem, your family members and you know, the participants in your system, your health system, involved in this. And they're guaranteed that work. So it's much more of a holistic approach to general health. I, I think if I can also make a comment on that, um, in many ways, uh, uh, building a value-based uh, system depends on cohort selection, on who, what to expect from whom. And in the definition of the cohort is, are not only clinical parameters, but also socioeconomic parameters. So if, for example, uh, two people with an identical clinical condition, uh, one has a family and one does not, for whatever reason, I think the care pathway for, the, for them in, in, in many ways would be different because of their, of their condition at the end. Back, now, if I'm responsible for the outcome, I better know that because I don't want to overtreat. I mean, someone to the family, I keep calling and telling them to do the same thing that the family is doing and wasting money. And I don't want to undertreat that someone without a family gets the attention of someone that I assume has a family. So it is that level of granularity that we've got to work the value-based system in all these diff different dimensions if you're going to be responsible for the outcome. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's the way to force this behavior. So treatment protocols very much based on, on the, the profile and these exactly. very many dimensions. Other mm -hmm. questions around the room? Right behind me. Thank you. Uh, Bob Garrett from Hackensack uh, Meridian Health. Um, I appreciate the, uh, the points of view from the, uh, the panelists, and uh, certainly I think it's fair to say there has been, over the past few years since the Affordable Care Act in the U.S. has passed, there's been a lot of innovation which has brought us into uh, value-based health care mm -hmm. and achieving some, some outcomes that, that are all desired. Um, but in spite of that, certainly most of health care is still delivered in a fee-for-service um, environment. So my question really is, um, with the debate going on now, uh, particularly in Washington, about uh, you know what might come next uh, for the Affordable Care Act, is it is is that a threat in terms of the innovation that has uh, already occurred, or is it perhaps an opportunity, um, as was suggested, maybe to um, lessen some of the regulatory environment, maybe um, encourage more collaboration and integration of care? So rather than just say that we're going to change the entire system. Rather, you know, maybe um, let's not throw out the baby with the bathwater. Is there that opportunity in the discussion today um, in your collective opinions? I, I would, uh, first of all, I think it's an excellent question. And within your question was an observation, which I agree with 100%. Uh, I think that 
Um, within the ACA, while it's not perfect, there are elements that we absolutely, uh, no matter what you end up covering it, no matter what system you put in place, uh, it's going to kind of look like the duck, quack like a duck, and it's going to be a duck. But you might call it an owl. Um, <laughs> so because the system doesn't work if there's not some incentives to play or to be to be to to to, to get into uh, uh, the system. So uh, I think that there's opportunities to go where you uh, suggested in, in some of these other payment models. Uh, but I think to wholesale, throw out any single element uh, is going to be uh, problematic. And I'm using my voice, our voice, in every way that we can. Because this is too big, too consequential to get wrong. We have you know, tens of millions of people that get up every day um, and are confronted with health issues. We have to have some stability for them. Because if we don't, uh, the entire society pays uh, for that. So I just. I'm hopeful that we take the best of what we have, we tweak that, we add uh, to it, but let's not go backwards uh, because I don't think we have the luxury to wipe the slate clean. Can I yes. just add? Sure. Add, mm -hmm. um, one of, a lot of people talk about the Affordable Care Act in broad strokes, and they're not really specific about some of the elements. And, the Innovation Center that was part of CMS uh, is part of the Affordable Care Act and is one of the reasons that we've had as many um, innovations and, and studies of innovations in the healthcare delivery system uh, that we've had. And if we take that away as part of um, adjusting or repealing the Affordable Care Act, we're not going to have the same laboratory to move forward as quickly. And it's very clear, we've got to figure out how to get better value for our health care dollar. Uh, we just can't keep going in this way. So I think there's some very specific elements that we have to create that opportunity, as you suggested, to have the conversation. Steve? So it is called the Affordable Care Act. Come back to Bob's question. And a large part of what has been worked on is better access. And we talk about the better access. So three years ago, it's about 45 million people in the United States that did not have health insurance. That number's down to 25 million, roughly. Um, we agree about 20 of those million that now have insurance and didn't have before came through the expansion of Medicaid in about half the states, and the other came through the exchanges. So to get back to Bob's question, uh, what we forget is you know, half of this population in the United States gets their health care through Medicare and Medicaid. And actually, uh, to Bob's question, a large part of that that's paid for by the government has moved to much more of a population health model with mm -hmm. managed Medicare and managed Medicaid models. So healthcare insurance companies are taking risks for a population. In those models, it's all about value. You contract with a healthcare insurance company as the U.S. government, and you are, you are taking the risk. And we actually work with those organizations to improve the quality of care at lower cost. That, if you go through the math, is 45 million people that are covered under Medicare, 120 million under Medicaid, you have 160 million people in that population. That's half of the U.S. population. The other half of the population is employer-sponsored health plans. And as a large employer that self-insures 60,000 people, I'm all for competition and getting better health care. So I think employers and consumers are going to drive that other half of the equation despite what we put in place. We're going to be shopping for better health care. Yeah, and by getting better health care, it's got to be some qualitative measures of quality and also cost and efficiency. And the exchanges are a good example. It was a good experiment of competing based, on, based upon output. You know, what is the quality of care and what's the cost of that care? And that was the beginning of that model. So that piece of it, I think, will continue. I want to get so, a few more questions yeah. and right over here. Yeah. I'm Antamir from Saudi Arabia. I feel like uh, having um, value-based health care or getting value for your health, we need to have two different things because um, if you optimize in every part of the value chain, we are in the distribution of value chain, then you cut out the costs. Diagnostics more than 50 years ago and 15 years ago were doing reportable testing for all diagnostics and it was introduced in Saudi at the time because the government wasn't running efficiently, there was a lot of expiry. So we took it over and get paid on the reportable testing, we give consignment. But that concept was with a purpose to get value. 
But it's a knife with two edges when you start to go mm -hmm. for get your money back with healthcare. Some people don't make it after an operation. How do you give them their money back? <laughs> uh, on other points. Uh, <laughs> so I think uh, when, when somebody's providing a healthcare from end to end and knows that there's part of the cost is not going to be paid, they will bill that cost to someone else. Like in bariatric surgery, when somebody doesn't get, uh, get a false uh, uh, health, uh, it's one per mil. And he pays for the cost tomorrow. That will be built on the cost of someone else. So I really believe we need to separate getting your value for health, moving the entire industry into uh, 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 giving health uh, with a solution will be a big challenge. And it's going to be a complete quantum change in the whole value chain. I, I don't see it happening as easy as maybe you can explain more to me. Well, I'm not saying it's easy. But, uh, I don't think we have a choice. I don't think we have a choice. I, I think otherwise the system gets so fragmented. Uh, with uh, Look, I, I give this very simple example. Many of you are business people. If I paid our salespeople based on the number of sales calls versus the amount of sales they bring in, I think I'd have a disaster in my hands. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially what we do for healthcare. We pay people for an activity as opposed to the results that they achieved. And I don't mean any single um, sort of uh, instituent in, in, that, in that whole chain. It's all of us. We, we get paid, we put a device in, and we get our money, and we go home. And now, ethically, we all care. They all works. Doctors do care, but no one gets paid on it. And, and so you build up these systems which, are, which, which reward activity and incentivize activity. And I think you just got to get over that. And it's not easy, but it has to be done. Yeah. And I think it's a moral imperative. I don't think that uh, sometimes we talk about these uh, concepts as if we're gifting them. Uh, to people out there, and we're bestowing this great, um, you know, thing upon them. I mean, the idea uh, or the proposition of that I come to you uh, understanding at least a little bit, hopefully, uh, what's about to happen, and here is the probable outcome. And if because of inefficiencies or whatever, uh, I get a different outcome, the, the, the idea that there would not be some reconciliation of that when you're talking lives in many cases is, I, I mean, it's not even uh, conceivable. But it's not the what, as we talked about earlier. It's the how, and that's our challenge. Socially, uh, emotionally, clinically, it's the how in bringing it all. Together. I'm going to take a question right back here. Stefan Larson from the Boston Consulting Group. I'd like to broaden or add a, a comment to the discussion. We've had many years where physicians are increasingly dissatisfied with being doctors. The choice of profession is increasingly seen as maybe not the right one. It used to be people were really pleased when they made the choice. Now that is falling down. We've defined quality for many years as compliance to guidelines. And for a medical doctor, that's a pretty boring way of doing your profession. You're not autonomous anymore. The payers tell you what to do. They limit your choice. Uh, in a world where you define success as outcomes, you're actually encouraging innovativeness. Mm -hmm. If quality is compliance to guidelines, you actually ask not to be innovative, not to come up with ideas that would give better results for your patients. But if you define success for the clinical teams as mm -hmm. better outcomes, mm -hmm. you're encouraging them. Right. Of course, mm -hmm. the basics, right? That's following the guidelines. But in addition, please think. And if we had international standards for measuring outcomes, we would have the entire clinical community across the world as a basis for innovation. Not the university hospitals to tell everybody else what to do, mm -hmm. but in fact, broader range of innovative teams in Calcutta, New York, and, and Cairo. And I think this is where we would get not only faster innovation, with the faster adoption of new tools, because it would be encouraged to do things better. So you would take innovations and bring them in and try them. So I think that we would not only have more enthusiastic clinical leaders, we would in fact also have faster rate of adoption of innovation. I see an enormous opportunity for healthcare mm. to move away from limiting the autonomy of clinicians, making them dissatisfied with, with their work, mm -hmm. to encourage them to innovate, drive improvement for what they're trained for. Health for patients. Mm -hmm. Any so place? Said, oh, go ahead. And yeah, just jump to, in there, yeah. I'm going to um, add to where I started. I'll give you an example. Um, so, if you recall where I started, I talked about <clears throat> precision medicine, the work we're doing with Morris Sloan Kettering, one of the top cancer institutes in, in North America and in the, in the world. 
Uh, we, uh, we used 34 actionable genes. We made it up with drugs. We can say which drugs will work or will not. But what we found as we launched that and tried to sell it to where most of cancer care happens, which is in community cancer centers around the you know, United States, it was very hard for us to have oncologists use that. And what we also found is it, it has to be a learning tool. And so to augment that, uh, we actually have now teamed up with IBM Watson. Okay? And IBM Watson is for genomics is actually going to be the learning cognitive computing system that helps us train over time. It's never intended to replace the physician. But it's helping the physician it's empowering make better decisions. better health with diagnostic yeah. insight. And it's what we talk about at Quest. It's giving them the tools, giving them the benefits of the world's knowledge at their fingertips to make better choices in cancer care. It's going to be very difficult, given the real-time nature of knowledge building in this world, to stay up to date at any given moment. But more tools at their fingertips can make better choices that can lead to better value. Yeah. yeah. Question right back here. Thank you for that wonderful discussion. I'm actually an academic, and I study guarantees, as it turns out. So I'd recommend a few things. Uh, one, I think you should all read an article called uh, The Power of Unconditional Guarantees, written by one professor, C.W.L. Hart, at the Harvard Business School, published in HBR probably in the mid-'80s, and we're kind of reinventing some of the material he's already talked about. Um, I won't talk about my own work in the area now. Um, if you look at Federal Express, absolutely positively overnight, it doesn't say absolutely positively maybe overnight. <coughs> And my question to you is, what can we learn from Federal Express? Let me answer it. Cincinnati Children's Hospital and Medical Center publishes all of its outcome data, including its process measures, on the website and aspires to be a Six Sigma organization. Mm -hmm. I don't see why any other healthcare organization cannot do that starting tomorrow. You have the data, publish it, and let's see what happens. So why does Cincinnati do that and others don't? Is there but something? But do they get paid for it? Yeah. Uh, uh, does Cincinnati they get, they get, Children's pay they, for the... They do get. They get paid. So they have a Six Sigma uh, level of performance, yes. uh, and they get paid. They so basically, actually, there's no failures? Yeah, exactly. So they get very low failures. They've shown improvement over time. Yeah. And furthermore, they actually get paid by uh, more clientele. Yeah, well, Customers so, come to them. And, uh, and that is yeah. spreading to other children's hospitals as yes, well. Yes. And uh, the other connection I would make to how you can improve the quality of uh, job satisfaction or joy for physicians is that they will tell you that one of the things they like about that is improving the quality of these children's lives actually is why they went into medicine. And I, and, and I would just say, you know, on behalf of, of physicians, there's physicians in the room and on the panel. Uh, one of the things that I've learned is that uh, physicians ultimately uh, want the best outcome possible for their patients. Uh, that's what they get up uh, to do, is to take uh, to care of people, to be, uh, to be helpful. So I think the other, second thing that I've uh, learned over these 30 years is that uh, evidence is important and data is important. And that um, one, if you have the data, if, if I am showed Dr. Dean that to do a hip replacement, if you We've got the data to show globally that if you use this protocol uh, uh, this, uh, and follow this procedure, uh, you're going to get the best outcomes. It's not even debatable. It, there's, there's that proof. What physician would not want to use that data? And I, we, we have 10,000 physicians, so I know what some people are thinking. You know, what planet are you from, Lloyd? Um, that there would be uh, those that don't. But I think that would be more the exception. And I would say I agree uh, with you, uh, but uh, I worry about not enough data, too much data. Okay. And You've got to sort down to impact. Mm -hmm. And last question back here. Hi, I'm Natalie J.C. Hobber, and I'd like to just throw in um, something that probably shouldn't be discussed right now. I'm not sure. <laughs> But um, I, we've talked a lot about the US and you know, other parts, and I have got West African roots. And I'd like to talk about, or perhaps if the panel has any thoughts, about the influence of external factors such as fake drugs that are being produced and how that may affect the trust 
mm. of patients in the you know in hospitals, mm -hmm. especially in third world countries. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on that? Big topic, but yeah, I would, I would, you know, I would say we recognize that that there is a, a significant issue with counterfeit drugs, not just in third world countries, but in um, today in the developed world. Uh, because there is potential money involved, and so you're you're always going to have that issue. So, we're working on ways to ensure the integrity of the supply chain. One of the things that the pharmaceutical industry is doing now is looking at ways to use technology to ensure that from the time that that drug leaves the manufacturing site until it is consumed by the patient, that there is a trackable mechanism so that we can avoid or we can, we can uh, try to eliminate counterfeit drugs. Right now, our way of eliminating it is we all have large anti-counterfeit forces that go in and try to track down where the source is. And that work is gonna continue, but I think the long-term answer is technology. With that, I wanna try to make some closing remarks and jump in here. Um, the sort of take-home thoughts for today is as I listen, I hear that value-based medicine or paper for pay for performance models are the way of the future. They're tricky to implement. We need an integrated system. It's not clear that how to form that system, but it has to happen. It's the way of the future. Agree? Agree. <laughs> all right, thanks so much for joining us, all of Thank you. you. Thanks Thank for you. coming. Thank you.